Aloha, this is Sean with Homestead in Hawaii. Today I am super excited to bring you a step-by-step how-to on how to create a food forest in your own backyard. And I'm gonna use my mom's property as an example. She's got a half acre and we're gonna develop some of this land here into a new food forest. And we're starting from scratch here. All we have is bare lava rock. There's barely any soil. When you say you have rocks in your soil, you don't even know what you're talking about. All we have is rocks here. So we're gonna utilize certain techniques that'll allow us to grow food and be able to create abundance. And if we can do it here, you can do it where you live, especially if you have just a little bit of soil. So today we're gonna to go over what a food forest is, why create a food forest, what you need to be able to start a food forest of your own, and exactly how to do it. Okay, so why not just grow a couple tomatoes or zucchinis or whatnot and just be done with it? Well, there's no problem to it. In fact, I just got back building a whole covered grow area so that I can do just that. But if I concentrated on just growing annuals, I'm missing a whole world of edible food crops that will not only regenerate my landscape, but also provide food for me and my family with very little input. Annual production out here tends to just destroy the soil. Anytime the soil is bare, a rainstorm washes it right off it in the ocean. And that is no way to create a regenerative food system. We need to focus on more perennials that provide food that thrive in our tropical climate, that want to grow here, and that hold that soil in place and in fact build more soil. Annual crop production will not do that sustainably over the long term. So when we get into thinking about creating a food forest, one of the first things we want to do is to identify our goals. Why are we creating a food forest in the first place? Do we want to just grow food for myself and my family? Do I want to try and make a little bit of income off of it? Do I want to produce enough to feed not only myself, but the neighborhood as a whole? These questions, these goals that we want from our food forest will allow us to identify what we want to create. If you're just looking for something to provide you a little bit for you and your family, you don't need to go that big. But if you want to provide a solution to the local food system, then your design is going to look a lot different. So identify your goals and identify how much you want to work to achieve those goals. So once we identify our goals, the very next step is just to sit and observe your site and to also observe uh, perhaps a native forest that is near your site. We can learn a lot from the native forest. The plants and animals within a native forest can really tell us what wants to grow in a particular environment. And when we come back onto our landscape and we just take some time to observe, to watch it through the seasons, to watch it through the different times of day, to see what animals show up, that'll really help us guide an effective design so that we can succeed. And so we don't have to go back over and over fixing mistakes that we were quick to implement. Instead, we'll have a clear plan for how to create that awesome food for us that we want so much. One of my observations when I got here was that there's barely any soil. It's almost all rock. We might've had an inch of topsoil, before we just hit straight lava rock. And because of that, the trees here, they don't tend to root deep down into the ground, but spread their roots out over the surface of the ground. And that observation has allowed me to find uh, ways to plant trees around here that don't require digging into that rock because it's impossible. You need a jackhammer to do it. And I figured that out through observation. So you're a continuously honing in your observation even after you begin to implement your project. But it's very important to take some time before you start your project and observe your site. Just meditate on it for a little while. Don't feel like you need to rush into anything. This is not just a video of you just sitting down and watching. You need to take action. If you're on a site that you are already planning on developing into a food forest, get a notebook, get some paper, start to draw out a basic layout of your site and get out there and walk your site in the rain, in the snow, on hot sunny days, at night, in the morning, in the evening. 
get out there and mark all your observations down onto that paper. If you haven't had a chance already, I did a whole series of design videos from creating your base map to zone and sector analysis that it should be a really great resource for you to create a design for the, your food forest to hone in what you learn here on this video today. So we have a couple type of food forest layouts that we can have out there in the world. I'm on a small half acre property and we are gonna create a sort of a mix of a orchard, more wild food forest where there's not going to be any rows, but we're going to have fruit trees intermixed with different layers, all kind of in a haphazard pattern. It's not for commercial production, it's just for home use and beauty. There are other types of systems. If you're, say, on a 200-acre property up in Waimea, you can create more of a silvopasture or alley cropping system where you have all these large grassland areas where we're ranching cattle and whatnot, oftentimes all you'll see is grass. But you can intermix food and timber species into those systems, like long hedgerows of these trees that can create windbreaks, that can produce food for not only you, but the animals as well. It could produce material for your building or for making fences. A lot of uses can come from intermixing these little um, alley cropping systems. And the animals can graze in between and graze the grass and the fallen fruit. And that'll create a healthier animal in the long run and a healthier ecosystem as well. There's also uh, another type of food forest that we may be familiar with in parts of the islands or in the Amazon or even in parts of North America where we've had a long history of traditional people um, working with the land is the, the more closed canopy food forest. Out here on the island of Hawaii, there is an area called Green Lake where I used to hike a lot before the lava flow and they had these really old breadfruit trees and kukui nut trees and these huge banana groves and a lot of these species were there from when the native Hawaiians tended that land and they created these crazy food forest systems and these stories are around all over. That's a great system that we can evolve to but most of us are going to start from pasture to orchard to the mid-succession to that late-succession food forest. So my mom's property is kind of at the pasture system stage. It's just mostly grass that was growing, but now we're gonna try and evolve it to the orchard mid-succession stage. And then hopefully one day, it'll become that more mature old growth stage. Hey guys, before we go any further, why don't you just take a quick moment and plant your finger on the like button. I work hard to try and bring you videos every week. All you have to do is just hit that like button. All right, let's get back to it. All right, so I wanted to show you the design that we came up with for my mom's place. In order to make this design, we started out with the base map. And we just included what was already on the property. Then we created a zone map. A zone map kind of tells us how the energies flow through the property. So you can see here our zone 5 is our native forest area. Our zone 1 is the area that is most often visited. Zone 2, zone 3, and so on. You'll notice there's no zone 4 because this site is pretty small and doesn't have a zone 4. And then we also created a, a sector map. A sector map highlights where the water comes from, where the view shed might be, the angles of the sun during the different times of the year, the direction the wind and the rain might show up from, whatever energies come onto the site from off-site, that's what you're gonna map in the sectors. And so we tied it all in together on this map here. Water would be the number one thing that we designed for, but our site doesn't really have much that it can do for water. We are catching rainwater, and we have some water pool up in this area. But other than that, it all just drains right through, even on the seven inch rainstorms, which we get quite often here. Nothing floods. So there's really not much we can do. The water is being infiltrated into the ground. It is happening. So whatever you would do for water catchment, 
would not happen here on the landscape. Now, if you live north of Hilo or in an area with lots of soil and lots of flooding, you may want to design water as your number one um, design point. Start there and then figure out everything else from that point. Because if you have, if you build your house right in the middle of a floodplain, uh, that is a type one error. So focus on water first and see how you can manage it. You want to slow it, spread it, and sink it. Um, but then beyond that, we created um, access. So our main access is this all green area. That's how our beds took shape by recognizing where we wanted to have easy access. And then from there, we designed out our beds. We have native forest, and then here comes into our more of our food forest. To start it off, you come into the property and you'll have a, pretty much a big hedge of banana, bamboo, and this lilacoid trellis, which will be the entrance. So it'll kind of be closed off from the road over here. And then as you walk through the trellis, it'll open up into this whole edible food forest. And we have bamboo, banana, we have pigeon pea. Here's our little key over here. Pigeon pea is a small nitrogen fixing shrub that produces edible peas. And we have an ice cream bean tree, which is a, a tree that'll grow up and provide shade for our younger ulu or soursop or coconuts. And these ice cream bean trees are designed to be short lived. So um, as the fruit trees that we want to keep grow up, we will be cutting out a lot of these nitrogen fixers, maybe even only keeping one of them for biomass material but the the fruit trees will begin to take over as the system evolves now you see in pink this is an area where we plan on planting a, a lot of purple sweet potato and then over here the gray area that's filled in is going to be kalo and so you can see over here that we have some avocado some native ojillas over here we have a little pineapple patch and then back here is our chicken run where the compost will be located easy access for my mom to get to and easy access for the chickens to be able to access for their own feed um, and then over here i want to mention we got our bees we located our bees a little out of the way in the driveway so that they aren't in any walking paths and eventually these coconuts will grow up to where we can be um, put in a hammock or something and hang out there okay so now you have a design going you have your all your structures you have your gardens in place now you got to figure out what you're going to put in those gardens what plants do you want to grow and this is a good time for you to create a master plant list in fact i created a basic master plant list for plants that grow in various areas of hawaii that you can use to be able to create one of your own on your site and what i suggest doing is you start with your larger plants and go down to your smaller plants so i like to identify my tree species my fruiting trees my timber trees my nitrogen fixing trees and continue on down that list going down to root crops and vines and feel free to check out the description below for the plant list i made up and feel free to borrow off of that one okay it's finally time to implement our design it's been a long time coming. We have been working on a lot of the theory and the behind the scenes work, and now is the time for all the glory and getting it installed, right? Well, hopefully this whole time, you have been collecting materials for your new food forest. I'm talking soil, mulch, manure, plants, whatever it is, you should have been collecting a long time ago. If you have an ample budget, good. You'll be able to get it all right away. But for the rest of you, start collecting, start scrounging, start finding whatever you can to create your food forest. So the first part of implementation is to begin harvesting the rain. Like I said at our site, the water just drains right through. So how we're harvesting the rain is collecting water off the roof and heading into this um, water tank right here. And this water tank provides all of the water needs for our home. We have a flush toilet. My mom drinks from that water tank. And well, we don't have to water our garden, but it's only for the home use. And that is how we are catching our rainwater here. The rest of it just drains right through the rocks. We cannot stop it. But for some of you, you live in sites where you're gonna have to build swales 
or divert the water from certain areas and move it to others, this is the time to do it before doing anything else, is install your water systems and deal with water now. All right, so now we're gonna install our access ways, our driveways, our pathways, our fencing, our irrigation. We're gonna get all that down at this point in our implementation design. Here on my site, I already have fencing installed. I already have my driveway put in. So I am ready for the next stage here. So we are at this stage now, building soil. For months, I have been gathering mulch and manure and cinder soil and bringing it here onto this site so that I can then spread it out for the design I made for the food forest. Before moving all that material, we took our design that we had on paper and transferred it onto the landscape by using a little bit of spray paint to mark out the beds. In fact, after I got my spray paint design installed, I gave the can to my son because he just wanted to play with it and he ended up creating way cooler beds. And so I'm using a lot of his designs now. And that's sort of what I'm talking about when your design will change. Sometimes when you're on site from what you drew on paper, that's exactly what happened to me. And so I'm really thankful he was there just playing around with that paint can because he created all these new lines that just really seemed to work for the space. After we got the outline of our beds, we then began to move our material. And we didn't use any cardboard here because I use so much material that I'm not really worried about weeds coming up from underneath the mulch and material that we put down. It's more of a problem, weeds are more of a problem creeping in from the sides. That's where I tend to notice the issues. So I didn't want to waste my time collecting cardboard. I'd rather get mulch and manure and stuff like that and so I'm not using cardboard on my site, but if you have an easy access for cardboard, it is a great way to suppress weeds. And what you do after that, you can just put mulch straight over it, and then we can plant in sort of what I like to call these mulch pots. Or you can do areas where you just put the cinder soil down and maybe some compost and manure, and then mulch on top of that. And then when you wanna plant, you can just dig a little hole, plant into that, and you're good to go. But whichever way you choose, whatever resources you have, for the most part, it'll work. Throughout the years, you just gotta keep adding material to your soil. I am constantly going and getting more fertility for my garden. Within months, the mulch and everything breaks down and practically disappears. The tropics eat this stuff up. All right, it's planting time, and we're gonna focus in on this area right here. On my design, I have a bamboo plant being put in right here. But we, when my son came in, he changed the shape of the bed and now we have room for another plant. We're gonna put a fruit tree there and we're gonna intermix a few nitrogen fixing trees amongst these two main crop species. And then I have some ground covers and uh, some shrubs that we're gonna put in here as well. Okay, when you start planting, go ahead and start with your fruit trees first and any larger plants first, and then gradually move your way down going to root crops last. That way you don't trample over anything. And you can see that we are um, thinking about the end game in mind, but also realizing that we have a lot of room right now before those dominant tree species become full grown and mature. So I could put a lot more ground cover in right now and get more production out of those guys as I will later on. When you come over to my place, you'll see that the trees have begun to take over and there's less of the ground cover layer because they're starting to shade more areas out. But the trees themselves are now producing a ton, which is pretty cool. And I still have areas utilizing that sunny edge where I can grow those ground covers. So I just wanted to throw in a disclaimer. If you don't believe what I just did will work for you, it happened here on my property behind me. Just mulch, manure, a little bit of cinder soil, laid it down on the ground, and now I have these really mature fruit trees, nitrogen fixing trees, shrubs, ground covers. And so this could be what happens at your place after what?
eight years. Well, I still have more areas to plant out for my food forest here. I'm not gonna take you through that whole mission. You saw them in design. I'm gonna be planting out the fruit trees and down to the ground cover in the same way that we just did in this bed with the bamboo and avenue. And as you can see, it's really not that hard to create a food forest. When you're thinking about plant selection, think about something that it can produce. Can it produce food? Can it produce medicine? Can it produce timber? The ticket is getting plants that provide multiple functions in your garden. And that's what we're currently creating in this backyard and what I created next door at my place. So I hope you were able to learn something today as we installed part of the system here at my mom's house. I cannot wait to show you the more evolved system as it grows through time. Probably in about three or four years from now, I'll be getting tons producing off this property. I'm surprised right now, I even have a banana starting to fruit that I only planted like six months ago. And that's pretty quick for bananas. So I can't wait to see what this place can do. So till next time, everyone. Aloha.